All right, so the MacBook Pro 13 M1 has been my daily driver now for the past six months. And I thought I'd give you some insight into what my experience has been like. So let's go. The purpose of this video is to give you some insight into whether an M1 device is worth buying or not. I'll cover how the chip has held up over the past six months, and if there have been any issues that have shown up over time. I'll also revisit some of the support issues that I had back in December with the M1 chip, and how the native Apple Silicon support scene is looking today. And I'll also give you my recommendation for whether to buy this or not. One of the main things that I was excited about before I got my hands on the laptop was the idea that the company that's creating these super powerful yet cool to the touch tablets tablets known as iPads is now going to develop their own processors for laptops which gave the promise of an ultra powerful laptop that never gets hot essentially the couch developers dream and when I first got the laptop this was the first thing that I wanted to test and in my early testing it definitely held up to the promise it never got hotter than what I would call slightly below lukewarm and this was also after heavy use but the question is how has this held up six months later with updates and software installs and basically never turning the laptop off ever well it still never really gets hot and I would say that it gets like lukewarm but never really hot and to me this is just such a huge thing because generally I will actually use a laptop in the way that it's intended judging by the name at least which is on top of my lap. And the M1 is by far the most comfortable laptop to do this with. Compared to any other laptop that I've tried, none of them even come close. Yes, it gets a little bit warmer after several hours of use, but compared to literally all other laptops, it's cold. And the fan noise is still non-existent. I've heard the fans twice in six months. Now, if you're in like a completely silent room and you put your ear like right next to the laptop, then yes, you could probably hear something at some points. But what I'm saying is like, if you go about your working day as you normally would, then no, you will never really detect the fan noise. When I say that I've heard them like twice in six months, what I mean here is that I've like been able to detect any sort of noise or notice that the fan started increasing in speed. So this is not to the point where like all I could think about was the fan noise. It's just to the point where I was able to detect that there was some sort of noise, which, you know, by itself is really impressive, I think. But couple this with the performance that this machine is actually capable of. And it actually becomes like it really becomes unfathomable what this is. All right. So I tried to build or like hold some sort of tension about like whether I would recommend this or what I think of it has it held up has it not held up but by now you probably know that I would definitely recommend this laptop but either way let's take a look at some of the negatives of this laptop so if we look back at when I first got the laptop there were definitely some things that were not ideal about it mainly third-party software not supporting Apple Silicon. So let's take a look at what I said about that. Okay, so in the video I mentioned that Homebrew wasn't supported yet, and that meant that installing certain things wasn't as easy as just typing brew install. But I didn't really have to wait too long because this was fully supported by February of that year. So I got the laptop in mid-December and it was supported in February, which means that right now Homebrew is definitely supported, fully supported on the Apple Silicon. The next thing that I said in the video was that Flutter worked, which was not quite the case. It worked, but only via the Rosetta translator process thingy, which means that I was able to work with it, but not natively. So how does this look today, six months later? Today, Flutter is almost 100% natively supported. Some things still use Rosetta to compile, so it's not fully optimized yet. But I should also mention that Flutter, even via Rosetta, has worked really well ever since the start, and I haven't really noticed any like performance issues or anything like that nor have I actually noticed any real performance gains over time as like Flutter started natively supporting Apple Silicon more and more, which I think is really a testament to how good Apple Silicon actually is, that it's able to like deliver this top of the line performance even via a translation process like Rosetta. After this, I mentioned that certain Python libraries weren't fully supported on Apple Silicon yet. And this was actually quite a big problem for me because it meant that for like several months, I didn't even bother trying to program in Python on my Apple M1. And this is because like anytime I tried to, it was just such a horrible experience because of 
the stuff just not being supported and it just meant that I was like running into bug after bug after bug. However, now most Python libraries seem to work for the things that I've tried. Scikit-learn, for instance, which I mentioned in the video, now has full support. And if there are any like niche Python libraries out there that don't work yet, then they will actually work via Rosetta. And like I said, I haven't really found any performance issues or anything like that using Rosetta. And to me, it's just been super smooth even though I would say like I'm not the most rigorous Python programmer out there that uses tons of obscure libraries or anything like that. But right now I work in Python without any issues and I've been doing so for the past couple of months. So the Apple Silicon support system has grown really rapidly in the past six months. And I would say that probably in like another six months, it will probably be hard to find things that don't actually support Apple Silicon. And also I would say that all of the problems that I mentioned are very like developer specific, meaning that if you're like a regular user, then you wouldn't have even noticed any of these issues if you bought your laptop in the past couple months. All right, so now let me just take a quick second to talk about Brilliant, who very kindly agreed to sponsor this video. If you haven't heard about Brilliant, Brilliant is a website and app designed for learning about math and science. They have tons of really interesting courses on computer science that I think you guys would really enjoy. When I was in school, me and a lot of my classmates would use Brilliant to learn about certain complex topics in computer science, like certain algorithms or math concepts that we felt our teachers didn't do a great job of explaining. So Brilliant really earns its name by actually being a brilliant way to learn. If you're interested in computer science, math or science in general, then I would highly recommend going to brilliant.org slash calholden to sign up for free. The first 200 people will get 20% off their annual premium membership. Okay, so the next thing that I want to mention just quickly is the battery life. And this is again, of course, quite insane, which uh, like I mentioned at the start, I never turn off my laptop really. In the past six months, I've turned it off maybe like four times. So it's basically always on. And the battery life is really, really good. And I think it's really worth emphasizing because in terms of everyday use, I don't even know how long it lasts because I charge it so rarely. Now that's not to say that it's like it lasts several months or anything like that. It's just that it lasts so many days that I forget when I charged it last. It's to the point now where it feels kind of foreign to get the low battery notification. I feel like this whole video basically comes across as pretty much as biased as it gets and it probably seems like I'm like the biggest Apple fanboy out there and I'm, I'm really not that at all. I like Apple but I also really like Dell, I like Lenovo, I like Razer, HP and all those laptops I get really excited about. It's just that now none of them really seem to compare in my opinion. One might be slightly faster faster in a specific test and one might have slightly longer battery life or faster wake up time but none of them seem to be able to combine all these features in one machine the way that Apple has done here and knowing that the M1X or M2 or whatever Apple will call it is probably right around the corner it just feels like AMD and Intel have a lot of catching up to do in order to beat Apple. Also as a side note the wake up time is still crazy fast like I said I never turn it off and it still wakes up before I've finished opening the laptop up. So would I recommend this laptop? Big reveal coming. No, I would never, of course I would recommend this laptop. Of course I would recommend it, a thousand percent I would recommend this laptop. I would recommend you to get any Apple M1 laptop that you can find actually, whether it's the MacBook Air or the MacBook Pro. Uh, really, I just think that it seems like it's the best choice of laptop that you can get right now. And the reason for this is that I really believe that this laptop will hold up for several years to come. <clears throat> famous last words. But in all seriousness, I really think that Apple went out quite hard here to really distinguish themselves as better than Intel and AMD. So they probably poured almost all they were capable of into this chip to make sure that it was a success. I mean, their entire two trillion, yes, that's two trillion dollar business, at least somewhat depended on this chip being successful. So my guess is that the M1X or the M2 or the MX, whatever Apple ends up calling it, will probably not be that big of an upgrade compared to the M1 and I'm not an expert or anything at like this but I'm just thinking that like if the next chip is as big of an upgrade as the M1 was then we basically probably need to look into what kind of dark magic Apple has developed that basically allows them to put themselves this far ahead of everyone else. Anyway, that's it for this one. I hope you enjoyed it. And I also wanna mention that I'm actually creating courses over on Patreon right now. And one of my most recent ones is how to build a trading bot, which is available in full on my Patreon account 
which means that you can just basically sign up once and then you can unsubscribe straight away and you'll have access to the full course if you want to. But also no pressure to do that. I really just appreciate that you watched this video and that you watched it this far. So uh, yeah, thank you for watching and I hope I'll see you in the next one.